All praise belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Lord of the worlds, the one and only true God, the most compassionate, the merciful. There's nothing like him whatsoever, yet he is the all-hearing and all-seeing. And peace and blessings be upon our master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, the final messenger of God, the seal of the prophets, the commander of the righteous, the leader of the messengers, and the beloved of the Lord of the worlds. Alhamdulillah, we've entered into the last 10 nights of the blessed month of Ramadan. These are some of the <coughs> holiest nights uh, of the year. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, uh, after taking an oath, wal fajr wa layalin ashr. And there's some difference of opinion amongst the Mufassireen <coughs> as to what these nights, 10 nights, refer to. Some of the exegetes say that they refer to the first 10 nights of the month of Muharram. Others say the first 10 nights of Dhul Hijjah. And yet others say the last 10 nights of Ramadan. Of course, this was when the Quran was first revealed to our master Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala says, Shahr Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Quran. Hudan lil-nasi wa bayyinati min al-huda wal-furqan. Faman shahida minkum al-shahra fal-yasum. The month of Ramadan is that wherein the Quran was sent down as guidance to mankind, as clear proofs of guidance and the criterion. Let him among you who was present fast during this month. So first and foremost, we notice from this ayah that the month of Ramadan is primarily associated with the Quran, then fasting. Fasting during Ramadan was prescribed during the Medinan period. The Qur'an is really at the heart of this month. What is the Qur'an? Al-Huda wal-Furqan. The guidance and criterion. That is to say, it is the basis by which we judge other religions, other traditions, uh, other philosophies, other theologies, other worldviews, etc. It distinguishes truth from falsehood and the lawful from the prohibited. Our mother, as Sayyidatu Aisha, radiallahu ta'ala anha, she said, كان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يجتهد في العشر الأواخر ما لا يجتهد في غيره. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم would exert himself during the last ten nights like no other time. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم would seclude himself in the masjid and Jibreel alayhi salam would visit him. And of course, Jibreel alayhi salam was the archangel who would bring the revelation to him. Say, whoever is an enemy to Jibreel alayhi salam, for indeed he reveals it, i.e. the Qur'an, upon your heart by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when Jibreel alayhi salam would visit the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam in the masjid, uh, they would recite the Qur'an to each other. This is called al-mu'arada, which linguistically means a mutual presentation. This was an annual review of the Qur'an. This was an annual review of the Qur'an during each Ramadan. And this was reported by several Sahaba. And in his final Ramadan, the Prophet ﷺ reviewed the Qur'an twice with Jibreel alayhi salam. So during the Prophet's time, <clears throat> there was widespread memorization of the Qur'an, an annual view of the Qur'an, and scribal recordings of the Qur'an. The entire Qur'an was written down by command of the Prophet ﷺ in his lifetime. The preservation of the Qur'an is without question. Inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra, inna lahu lahafidhun. Indeed, we sent down the reminder. And indeed, we are its guardians. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaking in the plural of majesty. So to our young people <clears throat> and older people, don't fall into an anti-Muslim rabbit hole on the internet or on YouTube where the Qur'an is being attacked. Most of these anti-Muslim channels, take it from me, I give you sincere advice, I've been dealing with these people for decades, most of these anti-Muslim channels are run by a bunch of charlatans who take advantage of the average Muslim's ignorance of certain particular issues. They want us to chase these red herrings and thus cause us to doubt the strength of our overall established narrative. Sometimes Muslim scholars have to listen to this garbage in order to formulate refutations if they feel that it's necessary. But the average lay Muslim should not even click on these videos, just ignore the algorithm. Imam al-Ghazali, he said that just listening to a zindiq or a mubtadir, listening, just listening to a heretic or an innovator is a breach of the right 
a breach of the haq of the ear. It is impermissible for your ear to hear such things, let alone listening to some vile kafir or mustahzi, some mocker who hates Islam because the truth of Islam destroys his own false theology or the ethical positions of Islam denounce his own degenerate lifestyle. This is really at the root of their hatred. Many Christian apologists and polemicists who attack the Quran, much of their vitriol is due to the fact that they recognize, they recognize the truth of our narrative when it comes to the Quran. So they're filled with envy and frustration because their narrative has been utterly deconstructed by secular academics and historians. This is called the guilt complex. They accuse our narrative of falsehood and attack our scripture because they know that their own narrative in scripture is an utter shambles. How do we know this? We read the Quran. The ayat of the Quran are so perfect, are so succinct. It's all in the Quran. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? What the kathirum min ahlil kitabi lo yurutunakum min ba'di imanikum kuffaran hasada min indi anfusihim. Min ba'di ma tabayyana lahum al haq. Many of the people of the book, many of the Ahlul Kitab, they long to make you disbelievers after you have believed through envy, through hasad, on their own account, after the haq, after the truth has become manifest to them. فَعَفُوا وَاسْفَحُوا حَتَّى يَأْتِيَ اللَّهُ بِأَمْرِهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٌ Forgive and pardon until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings His command. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is over everything powerful. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, essentially, get to work. وَأَقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةُ وَآتُوا الزَّكَاءُ وَمَا تُقَدِّمُوا لِأَنفُسِكُمْ مِنْ خَيْرٍ تَجِدُهُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ بَصِيرٌ So establish the prayer and pay the charity. And whatever good you send before you for your souls, you will find it with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Indeed, Allah is concerning what you do all seeing. وَقَالُوا لَيَدْخُلَ الْجَنَّةِ إِلَّا مَنْ كَانَ هُودًا أَوْ نَصَارَ تِلْكَ آمَانِيُّهُمْ قُلْ هَاتُوا بُرْهَانَكُمْ إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ بَلَا مَنْ أَسْلَمَ وَجْهَهُ لِلَّهِ وَهُوَ مُحْسِنُونَ بَلَا مَنْ أَسْلَمَ وَجْهَهُ لِلَّهِ وَهُوَ مُحْسِنُونَ فَلَهُ أَجْرُهُ عِنْدَ رَبِّي وَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَهُمْ يَحْسَنُونَ And they say none will enter paradise unless he be a Jew or a Christian. These are their vain delusions. Say bring your proof if you are truthful. No, whosoever submits to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and is a doer of good, his reward is with his Lord. And no fear shall come upon them, neither shall they grieve. وَقَالَتِ الْيَهُودُ لَيْسَتِ النَّصَارَ عَلَى شَيْءٍ وَقَالَتِ النَّصَارَ لَيْسَتِ الْيَهُودَ عَلَى شَيْءٍ وَهُمْ يَتْلُونَ الْكِتَابِ كَذَارِكَ قَالَ الَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ مِثْلَ قَوْلِهِمْ فَاللَّهُ يَحْكُمُ بَيْنَهُمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ فِي مَا كَانُوا فِي يَخْتَرِفُونَ And the Jews say the Christians follow nothing true. And the Jews, so then the Christian, the Jews say the Christians follow nothing true. And the Christians say the Jews follow nothing true. Yet they are both readers of the Bible. Like this speak those who don't know anything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will judge between them on the day of resurrection concerning what they differed about. Sadaq Allah. This is perfect. Subhanallah, the Jews say that God is absolutely one. The Christians say that he's three in one, there's a trinity. The Jews say that God is not a man. The Christians say God became a man who died for our sins. A'udhu Billah. The Jews say that repentance is all you need to be right with God again. The Christians say reconciliation is through blood sacrifice and vicarious atonement. The Jews say that every single commandment of the Old Testament is still binding. The Christians say the vast majority of the commandments are abrogated. kitab, And they're both reading the same exact book. Look at the chaos. Not only this, the Quran says, and modern textual criticism has confirmed that the Bible, Old and New Testaments, have suffered a degree of textual and exegetical corruption. Tahrifun nas, tahrifun ma'ani. There's no doubt about this. I can give you example heaped upon example, but this is not the occasion. But this is the state of their text. Yet because of a guilt complex, they attack the Quran. You know what they say about people who live in glass houses? And it's not all of them. They're not all the same. Right? We're speaking in general terms. But here's the point. The Quran that we read and recite today with its ahruf and various qira'at is the very same Quran that was recited by the Prophet ﷺ. There is no doubt in this. It is impossible to fabricate the Qur'an. It has always been impossible. Just as it is impossible today, it was impossible at any point in the past. The reason is because the Qur'an 
was and continues to be a mass transmitted living tradition. It is a mass transmitted living tradition. It was constantly heard and recited and memorized every day since its inception. How do we know how to pray? The sunnah of the prayer was a mass transmitted, mass practiced living tradition. The practice of the prayer was imprinted upon the companions. So was the Quran's recitation. Secular historians basically agree the words of the Quran were first uttered by the historical Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Whether they believe he was a prophet or not, he is the quote unquote earthly source of the Quran. This is the general historical consensus and only radical historical revisionists and anti-Muslim Ahlid Kitab with huge chips on their shoulders say otherwise. The Quran was written down, constantly recited and constantly memorized during the Prophet's life, you can't pray without the Qur'an. The Sahaba in Medina were praying five times a day, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, decade after decade. Around 650 the Common Era, less than 20 years after the passing of the Prophet wasallam, the Codex Committee of Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu anhu standardized the text based upon the dominant reading of the Prophet himself wasallam. This Codex Committee consisted entirely of eyewitnesses to the Prophet. They were all Sahaba, men who ate food with the Prophet, men who attended the Prophet's lectures, men who traveled with the Prophet, men who prayed behind the Prophet ﷺ. The Uthmani Codex, as well as its recitational tradition, were transmitted to the major Muslim metropolitan areas. Each major city received a Codex, a Mus'haf, a Naqari, who was a Sahabi and a Hafiz. Medina, Mecca, Basra, Kufa, Damascus, at least all received a Codex and a Qari who was a Sahabi and a Hafiz. These Qurra taught the people in those cities how to read the Quran. And we know the names of these Qurra. An additional manuscript was kept also in the state archives in Medina. This is called the Imam Manuscript. This is Sayyidina Uthman's personal manuscript, radiallahu anhu. The city of Kufa received a codex. Its qari was Abdurrahman al sulami radiallahu anhu. When we pray Jummah in a few minutes, you're going to hear the qara'a of Hafs ibn Sulaiman. This is the qara'a of 95% of the Muslim ummah. If you look in the back of a Hafs Mus'haf, you will find an Isnad, a chain of transmission. It will read the riwayah of Hafs ibn Sulaiman from Asim ibn Abi Najud. From Abdul Rahman al Sulami, this is the Qari who brought the Codex into Kufa from Medina, from Ali ibn Abi Talib, radiallahu anhu, and Zayd ibn Thabit, radiallahu anhu, and Ubay ibn Ka'ab, radiallahu anhu, three imminent, imminent Sahaba from the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, from Jibreel, alayhi salam, from Al Khaliq, subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is our chain of transmission. What other religious text has something like this? The answer is none. I've studied them. Not the Vedas, not the Dhammapada, not the Tao Te Ching, not the Torah, nor the New Testament. The Isnad is the secret of Islam. The other 5% of the Muslim Ummah, they recite the Quran according to Ibn Amr al-Shami, and Abu Amr al-Basri, and Nafi al-Madani. And there are sound asanid for these recitational traditions as well. But here's the point that people miss. The Prophet ﷺ, he recited many of the verses of the Qur'an in various ways. This was a function of the seven ahruf, which were all revealed to him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The ahruf are seven recitational variations. Over 30 sahaba reported the Qur'an was revealed ala sab'ati ahruf, upon seven variations. The Qur'an is multiformic. It is a multiformic text. It is a polyvalent text. That is to say, it displays multiple levels of meaning. We need to know these things and not allow these shayateen to deceive us. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Maliki Yawm din and Maliki Yawm din He is the owner of the Day of Judgment and the King of the Day of Judgment. This variation in recitation is intentional. They were both revealed to the Prophet sallallahu to enrich our understanding of our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. This harf is called nominal variation. Another example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمْسَحُ بِرُؤُسِكُمْ وَأَرْجُ لَكُمْ Anoint or wipe your heads and wash your feet for wudu. 
He also says, subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَمْسَحُوا بِرُؤُسِكُمْ وَأَرْجُلِكُمْ Wipe your heads and wipe your feet. This harf is called inflectional variation. You see, generally we wash our feet in wudu, but there are circumstances where we can wipe our feet. When do we do that? We look to the sunnah. This is a beautiful aspect of the Qur'an. A third example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا هُمْ بِمُؤْمِنِينَ And He says, وَمَا هُمْ بِمُؤْمِنِينَ This harf is called dialectical variation. You see, the Arab was the first standard bearer of the religion. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala facilitated things for the Arab and revealed certain words and phrases in different Arab dialects. This is the wisdom behind it. It's great wisdom. When the Qurra from the Sahaba arrived in these Amsar, these uh, major Muslim cities, they taught the people how to incorporate these Ahruf into the Rusum, into the consonantal skeletons of the codices. And uh, over time, certain recitations became prominent due to the prominence of their reciters. And these became the canonical Qira'at, like Hafs and Warsh and Ibn Amr and Ya'qub and Abu Jafar, etc. There are ten of them. And Quran masters like Qari Amr, may Allah preserve him, he knows all ten of them. The Prophet وسلم, he had over 100,000 companions. Ibn Asakir, in his Tariq al Dimashq, he mentions that Abu Darda, radiallahu anhu, a companion, had over 1,600 students in Sham. One of them was Ibn Amr, the Qari of Sham who rose to prominence. One companion had 1,600 students, teaching 1,600 students how to recite the Qur'an. Now imagine how many total students from the Tabi'een there were, from all of the Sahaba who transmitted the Qur'an. Even if only 10% of the Sahaba were transmitting the Qur'an, that's 10,000 uh, 10, Sahaba. And if each one just had 50 students, that's half a million students in the second generation. In reality, the numbers are in the millions. This is called mass transmission. This is called tawatur. The earliest extant manuscripts of the Quran are dated before 656 of the common era. Decades ago, before these manuscripts were widely accepted or discovered by Western scholarship, there was a controversial opinion held by a man named John Wansbro, professor at SOAS in London, the teacher of Crone and Cook. She said, uh, he said that the Quran was actually written in the 8th century, in Iraq, by a committee of various authors from the Abbasid court. He basically admitted that a single unlettered man living in the Hejaz in the 7th century could not have possibly written the Qur'an. He could not have known these things. But now we have confirmed Qur'an manuscripts from the 7th century, written in Hijazi text type. The Birmingham manuscript can be dated to the Meccan period of the Prophet's life. So now, some of these radical revisionists, they have vacillated to the other extreme. So now they're saying that the Birmingham manuscript uh, was written before the Prophet ﷺ. First the Qur'an was written after the Prophet ﷺ. Now it's written before the Prophet ﷺ. Such obstinacy. No, the truth is in the middle. The Qur'an was written at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. And of course, this has always been the general historical consensus. There's nothing wrong with our narrative. There are no holes in our narrative. Sometimes even very learned people, they say things they regret later. Maybe he was having a bad day, going through some sort of crisis, but rest, rest assured, take it from me, I teach ulum al-Qur'an, there are no holes in our narrative. Or don't take it from me, do your own research. There's nothing about the Qur'an that a Western scholar at Harvard or Yale can say to a traditional alim that will throw this alim for a loop and confound him and, and cause him to have some sort of existential crisis. No, nothing. We have unparalleled, robust scholarship. We have al-Burhan fil ulum al-Qur'an by Imam Badr al zarkashi We have a, a masterpiece, al-Itqan fi ulum al-Qur'an by Imam Jalal al-Din al-Suyuti. We have al-Tashheel li ulum al-Qur'an, li, li, li ulum al-Tanzil by Ibn Juzay al-Kalbi. We have Kitab al-Masahif by Ibn Abi Dawood. We have two books called Kitab al-Qira'at by Ibn Mujahid and Shams al-Din al-Jazari. Now another reason why these revisionists claim that the Qur'an had multiple authors is because the Bible, without a doubt, had multiple authors. And I'm not just talking about like Isaiah or Jeremiah or Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Literary critics have definitively demonstrated that the five books that are traditionally attributed to Musa alayhi salam alone, the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, these five books were actually written by at least four authors. 
living in different lands in different centuries. This is a general consensus of biblical historians. Just by way of comparison, Isa alayhi salam, Jesus peace be upon him, he saw none of the four gospels that claimed to preserve his words. This is a huge difference when compared to the Quran. Whether anyone believes that the gospels were inspired scripture or not, Jesus never saw any of them. This is just a fact. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam, he knew what Al-Fatiha was. He knew what Al-Baqarah was. He knew what Ayatul Kursi was. He knew what Surah Yasin was. But if we took a time machine back to Nazareth, Palestine, in the year 30 of the Common Era, and asked Isa alayhi salam to recite Matthew chapter 23 or John 3.16, or 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he would not know what we were talking about. So when it comes to the words attributed to Isa after his departure, we must be discerning and critical. Some of his actual words are most likely there, but some are clearly not. The oldest complete New Testament manuscripts are dated 350 years after Isa The oldest complete Torah is dated 1500 years after Musa salam. The oldest complete manuscripts of the Qur'an are dated a couple of decades after the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu The Uthmani Codex, which was codified by eyewitnesses to the Prophet. This is a big difference. And here's another thing, I'll end with this inshallah. There's something called stylometric analysis. Stylometric analysis. This is a sophisticated analysis of uh, a linguistic style where statistical methods are used to determine the author or authors of a text. This is really cutting edge stuff. Modern stylometric analysis found that the Quran and Hadiths each had a single yet different author. There is one author of the Quran and there is a different author speaking as the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, in the Hadith. And these two authors do not match. SubhanAllah, of course they don't match. The words of the Quran are the very words chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah chose the wording of the Quran they were first spoken by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu yes, but they're not his words. The Prophet was the conduit through which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us his revelation. The literary style of the hadith are clearly distinct from the Qur'an. This is why many ahadith were fabricated. The Prophet's style, although highly eloquent, can be convincingly imitated. But the Qur'an is sui generis. It is one of a kind in its style and eloquence. There is nothing like it. It is impossible to imitate. It is mu'jiz. This means that the Qur'an has an internal incapacitating mechanism. So it's not that it's possible to imitate the Qur'an, yet Allah simply doesn't allow it. It is impossible to imitate the Qur'an. It is beyond human capacity. The Qur'an also has a deep compositional structure from the level of the individual ayat all the way to big suwar. The Qur'an displays parallelism and concentricism that is absolutely mind-blowing. This is incredible. There have been some modern attempts, attempts to imitate uh, the style and eloquence of the Qur'an by Arab-speaking Christians. This is an open challenge. These attempts are absolutely ridiculous. We read and analyze some of them in class at the college. And the students and I, we can't stop laughing when we read them. One time we laughed for an hour straight just reading what they believe to be on equal par with the Qur'an. وَمَا كَانَ هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ أَيُفْتَرَى مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ وَلَكِنْ تَصْدِيقَ الَّذِي بَيْنِ يَدَيْهِ وَتَفْصِيلَ الْكِتَابِ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ مِنْ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ أَمْ يَقُولُونَ إِفْتَرَاهُ قُلْ فَأْتُ بِسُورَةٍ مِثْلِهِ وَادْعُوا مَعْنِ اسْتَتَعَتُ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ And this Qur'an is not such as can be invented despite of Allah, but it is a confirmation of that which went before it and an exposition of that which is decreed for mankind. Therein there is no doubt from the Lord of the worlds. Or do they say he invented it? Say, bring a surah like unto it, and call for help on all you can besides Allah, if you are truthful. So the Qur'an is impossible to imitate <coughs> and, or fabricate due to its mass transmission, as well as its unique literary style. And hadith are different than the Qur'an. Most hadith are not mass transmitted. And as I said, the literary style of the hadith are clearly distinct from the Qur'an. Modern cutting edge stylometric analysis confirms this. Therefore, our ulama developed a highly robust system by which to authenticate hadith. We don't just accept anything willy-nilly. 
Our traditional ulama developed something called al-usul li naql al-hadith, the principles of hadith criticism or the principles of hadith authentication. This is a deep intellectual study. There's much more to say, but I'm out of time and my voice is gone. So, jazakallah khairan.